Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a bit about rattlesnake family life tonight. Well, there we go. Um, yeah, so I, it hasn't been that long since the idea of rattlesnake family life or snakes of any sort taking care of their babies seemed like a fairy tale. Um, I found out about it, gosh, it's been a little over 20, 30 years. It's been almost 30 years now. And I remember the first time I heard it, it just blew my mind. I mean, I had already loved snakes and thought they were really interesting. Um, but the idea of some of the snakes um, taking care of their babies just sort of brought it to another level. Um, and, you know, even amongst scientists, this was sort of a, a new thing for a long time. I mean, people have been seeing associations between adult snakes, including rattlesnakes, with their babies since, since humans have been making such observations. But it was written off even by um, this guy, Lawrence Clauber, who's considered like the father of rattlesnake biology here in the United States. He's very famous. And he wrote it off as just, ah, you know, mom's probably tired. That's the only reason she's hanging around their babies. Um, and that was the attitude by a lot of people. And to be honest, when I first started studying rattlesnake social behavior and interactions between mothers and offspring um, and other family members, um, I would still get that from other scientists who, who should have known better because it's it's been published that rattlesnakes take care of their babies now for, yeah, about 30 years. So it has been out there, but it's just people don't give credit. People don't give snakes credit a lot of times for the, the cool stuff that they do. Um, so for those of you who aren't that familiar with snakes um, and rattlesnakes, I should mention that rattlesnakes do give birth to live young. Um, I know we think of reptiles like birds as being egg layers, but there are a handful of them that give birth to live young and rattlesnakes are one of those groups. Um, one of the other common um, types of snake that also give birth to live babies instead of laying eggs are garter snakes. And although I just saw a paper today about social behavior in garter snakes, which is really exciting, um, I am not aware of any observations of them taking care of their young. So, so this, this talk is all about parental care um, and other family dynamics. We're just going to be talking about rattlesnakes. Um, so start with the basics about mom taking care of their babies. What does that look like? You know, I think we all have this image, and you know, probably especially this group, but even non-birders, when we think about um, parents taking care of babies, the first thing that comes to mind is like Mother Robin bringing back worms and tearing them into the little pieces to give her babies. And, and that's, you know, that spoiler alert or whatever, but um, that is not something we have, we have seen in snakes. So um, when we first found a place where we had a lot of pregnant female rattlesnakes that we knew would be giving birth soon, um, and we had just started using these remote time-lapse cameras, we were really excited to hopefully get some video footage of what, what it looks like for a snake to take care of their babies. You know, we, we knew because it had been observed and published that, you know, they would hang out and stay with their babies until the babies shed their skin for the first time, which is 10 to 14 days after they're born. Um, but aside from that, there hadn't been a lot of observations of what that behavior looks like. And, and one of the reasons for that is that usually when we are observing snakes, even rattlesnakes, which a lot of people see as, you know, being scary and a formidable opponent, um, they are terrified of us. And so most of the time, the behavior we see when we see a snake is defensive behavior. Um, you don't get to see a lot of the other stuff and the use of remote cameras has, has really enabled us to see some of these cool things. Um, and so the first one or the one that we're talking about tonight is maternal care. So this is a, a time-lapse video taken at the nest of an Arizona black rattlesnake. Her name's Cat Mama. She's the big black lady in this video. And the little gray guys with brown blotches, those are her babies. They're about two days old when this video was taken. Um, the photos were taken about a minute apart and then stitched together to make this video. I apologize, the quality isn't the best, but this was taken 
gosh, nine years ago and the cameras just weren't that fantastic like they are now. <laughs> But the behavior still still remains one of the coolest the coolest stuff we'll see. So I'll just let you guys enjoy the rest of this video. This was taken over the course of about this, the daylight hours, um, like I said, when the kiddos were about two days old. All right, so I've pulled out some stills from that video. And just to show you some, some things that went on, because sometimes the video goes kind of fast. Um, that's cop, Cat Mama right there. That's at the beginning of the day um, before the babies have come out. Um, and so even before the family's like out there on the surface when they're still in their shelter, um, she takes a look around, she looks to the right in the first slide, and then she looks up, you know, kind of like she's making sure the coast is clear before she lets her kiddos come out. So this is a little bit later in the afternoon once they've been out for a while. And this was one of the things that we were, was kind of surprised and excited to see the first time we watched this. Um, so I'm used to pointing at the screen, which I can't really do, but <laughs> so I'll try to explain. So one of the little babies in front is crawling towards the front, um, sort of like down towards the, the bottom of the screen, away from the main pile of mama and babies. And, you know, he's getting, I kind of describe him as like that teenage kid or maybe even preteen that, you know, they're getting a little independent, thinking they're ready to, to set off on their own and take off. But mom is not sure that that's the case. And, you know, Rattlesnakes, far as we know, don't do any um, auditory communication with snakes. They can't actually hear themselves rattle, so they don't use that to talk to each other. Um, a lot of the communication between snakes is chemical, so stuff that they can smell, leaving smells for each other and smelling smells that other snakes have left for them. Um, but in this case, it's a, it's a touching. So she kind of reaches out. And at least what we can see in the time-lapse photography is just sort of sets her head on this little guy. And it, it seems pretty subtle. Um, sometimes it's hard to interpret behavior of animals, especially animals that um, you know, are using communication systems that are so foreign to us. Um, so we judge what they're trying to say sort of by their behavior. And that little guy like turns tail and goes right back under that rock with the rest of the family. So it seemed like he got the message um, that you need to come back now, which is pretty cool. Um, so this is another time-lapse video of a different family of Arizona black rattlesnakes. So this is, um, you know, I wouldn't say it's necessarily teaching, but what this family is doing is taking advantage of a summer rainstorm to come out and get a drink. So they're harvesting water off their own bodies and off of each other's bodies. Um, this video goes by pretty quickly, so I'm actually going to restart it just because it's so fast. Um, but it's one of the things that a mother rattlesnake perhaps can um, share with her kids and show them how to do. Um, a lot of times if you see snakes out crawling around and it starts pouring down rain, it startles them a little bit. And I could see that being really scary for a newborn baby, but for animals that live in the desert, it's really important to take advantage of water whenever you can get it. And so, you know, mom goes out first and, and starts drinking and then the babies, if nothing else, realize that that's a safe place to be because she's already outside. Um, so yeah, so, so pretty neat and lucky thing that we were able to capture here, or we thought so. Um, also just, I mean, watching babies drink and stuff is just, pretty cool and funny. It was another myth that's been out there for a while is that snakes don't need any water. They get all their water from their food, but um, they actually will take advantage of rain. And we've even seen them drinking snow um, over the winter. And when you get some like late spring snowstorms around here, um, yeah, in the desert, water is important and they will take it when they, when they can get it. <laughs> so, to be honest though, that stuff was real interesting, but when I first heard about rattlesnakes taking care of their babies, you know, the first thing that popped into my mind was 
you know, I, I want to see what happens if, if somebody tries to go after those babies or attack the family. Like, will that mother snake actually defend her babies? And that's definitely a tricky thing to see without remote cameras because, you know, as long as there's a big dumb human sitting there, even if they're sitting kind of far off with binoculars, they're still probably close enough where most other predators or any other predators, you know, aren't going to approach that nest. Um, but the cameras don't seem to have that same effect. Um, so this is another time-lapse video, another Arizona black rattlesnake family. Um, the mother in this case is brown. They're at the top of the screen with the babies. This is probably her first time having babies because she was a really small young mother. And we were lucky enough to, we were lucky, she wasn't maybe so lucky <laughs> to have a threat show up to this nest, but it was, Definitely not the potential predator we expected. And I'll let that one play again too, because it's it goes by real fast as well. And then also pulled out some stills. Yeah, so that, um, so then here are some of the, the photographs from that video. Um, in case you missed it both times, that was a rock squirrel, you know, like the guys that commonly visit your yard and probably you love them as, as much as we do for taking all your bird seed, or maybe you're cool with that and that's fine too. <laughs> um, but they're pretty annoying and, and, uh, occasionally um, perhaps deadly to, to rattlesnakes, which is kind of a surprise. So this is um, a couple minutes before the squirrel first showed up in that video. Um, Sigma is the snake's name and, and she's hanging out with several of her babies, um, just sort of chill. This is the frame immediately before the squirrel shows up. And I, I like flipping back and forth between these two because you know, already this is a this is a relaxed sigma right here. This is right before the squirrel shows up, and this is that typical defensive behavior that every rattlesnake in every movie is doing. She's she's coiled up, her head is lifted off of her body, and she's in that that S curve that you know translates to pretty much everyone that you know I'm about I'm about to strike. Like I I can bite you right now. Um, our time lapse videos don't have sound, but it's probable that she was rattling with this as well. Um, so the kind of perplexing thing the first time we watched this video was that this, uh, the arrow is indicating, because I realized the quality on this is not super, um, is indicating where her body is pointed. So the arrowhead is her head. And so she's looking up towards the top of the screen. Um, and in the video, like when I watched it multiple times, like to me, it seems like the squirrel comes from kind of stage left. So that was a little bit confusing. I was like, what is she doing? Does she not know what's going on? Why is she looking up there? Because yeah, so that's where the squirrel comes. He comes from, comes from the left, um, jumping right onto the pile of mom and babies. Well, we had an overhead camera at this spot, luckily, too. And so before the squirrel got onto the screen of that, the green camera that you can kind of see in the bottom of the shot, he was actually um, threatening them, probably doing some behaviors that we see rock squirrels doing often at rattlesnakes, which is some, some tail wagging, a communication that they use both with each other and to potential threats like snakes. Um, so in the direction that she was pointed, which is why she was facing that way and rattling and looking all like she was about ready to bite. So how that ended is a question that we often get. So we actually, the day that this was filmed, um, that morning we left this site for a couple weeks, I think. So we, we had set up the cameras and let them roll. So by the time we got back, and we had no idea that this had happened. We had never seen anything like this. We were not expecting any sort of squirrel interactions. And so when we came back, we just kind of pick up, picked up the cameras and left. And we didn't see anything obvious like, you know, dead snake babies or anything like that. Um, 
But in the years since then, um, you know, now that we know to keep a closer eye out for these sort of encounters, um, we're also never able to count the same number of babies in the, the frame after this. So it's possible the squirrel killed one of the babies. We think that's happened in a nest um, since then. We found some little chewed up baby rattlesnake bodies in the same area and, and, and there were rock squirrels near that nest too. So we think that's something that they do and there is an observation in the, in the literature, a published account of a squirrel um, killing, not a rattlesnake, it was a different species of snake, a non-venomous one, but it is something they would do. And you know, you can't blame them a whole lot. Adult rattlesnakes of this species, the males are certainly big enough to take on an adult squirrel. Adult females and adult males are big enough to take, you know, to eat, to kill and eat a juvenile squirrel. So it kind of makes sense that they would want to, you know, get them while they're, <laughs> they're young and vulnerable. Um, but yeah, it was something, um, you know, we were kind of, we were kind of surprised to see, not the threat we were expecting to get. And this was not the, this is kind of the best documented, but not the only time we've seen a squirrel um, come up and it, at least pester a family of rattlesnakes. And when we've had cameras set up outside of their, their dens in the spring, squirrels are just constantly coming up and displaying to the snakes. They just do it on a regular basis, which is probably their way of just saying like, hey, we know you're here. So don't be trying to like set up an ambush. Like we can see you, we know, we, we, we got you, we're on to you. So this is um, not time-lapse footage, so a little bit better. This was taken with uh, newer, one of our GoPro cameras. And it's a, a group of baby rattlesnakes. These are offspring of a snake we call devil tail. So at first look, you can see the, the little one towards the bottom of the screen crawling up to be with his siblings up at the top. Um, these guys are real cute. That's not the only reason I'm, I'm showing this. Um, at first glance, it kind of looks like maybe these babies have been abandoned. Where's the mom? You know, is she, does she not care about them? <laughs> maybe they don't take care of them all the time. Well, if you can, if you can take your eyes off that cutie coiling up at the top and look down towards the bottom, you'll start to see a little black snout poking out from underneath that rock. And that's devil tail. And she's actually been sitting underneath that rock, keeping an eye on those babies the whole time and just you know, I think when they um, started to crawl up to the top and that sort of like alerted her to maybe she needed to, to make sure everything was still all right out there, which is pretty cool. But just because you don't see mom uh, does not mean she's not there. So the, the squirrel stuff was cool. Getting to see moms taking care of their babies was really cool. Um, now uh, we do that, you know, we, we assumed that the mother would defend their babies and we knew that mothers took care of their babies before we started the study. Um, this stuff that I'm about to talk about was a complete surprise and this was the, we were the, the first that I know of to, to document this. Um, and this is helping, which is a pretty common thing in birds, especially birds that live in groups of more than a pair. Um, and basically helping or um, what humans call babysitting is where someone other than the parent um, helps care for the offspring. And oftentimes that'll be a relative um, and other animals that do this. It's common in some mammals as well. Um, but it was unknown in, in snakes. And, and, and now we've, there's some documentation of it in some lizards too. So this was something we were pretty excited to see. And you know, one of the reasons it can be difficult to see is if you just come upon an adult snake in babies without, um, most of the time, if you don't catch them and take DNA on everybody, like you don't know if, that, if they're related or not, if that is their mom. Um, with the uh, Arizona black rattlesnakes we monitored though, we had these situations that were really set up to be able to observe helping. So we would have in several cases, um, females would gestate together. And then once they're ready to give birth, they would share a nest site. And what we've observed several times now is that often the, the older females will give birth first. And then once they've given birth, they will crawl under the nearest rock and sort of let the younger mothers-to-be who are still pregnant take care of everybody else's kids, which 
you know, kind of seems a little lame and lazy, but it's also like a good, good learning from them. They've still got the older, more experienced mom there to help out if needed. Also, since they're still pregnant, they need to spend more time on the surface um, keeping warm so they can get ready to have their babies too. But the first time we saw this was with this pair of snakes. So this is Priscilla and House. So Priscilla's the mom. And I realize it's not obvious to everyone, but to us, we had been watching these snakes um, all year at this point. Um, Priscilla is still very pregnant. Um, right after they give birth, they basically look like deflated balloons. It's, a, it's very clear once they've finally given birth. And so Priscilla is the big brown snake. Um, if you can't find the baby, that's totally excusable. He's very hard to find. This whole little drama here took place under this rock, so they're hard to see. So there's my lovely art pointing out, this is where the baby's gonna be. That's the little guy we called House. So this isn't her baby, but they hung out together a lot. And so this was um, a series of photos that I'm gonna sort of walk you through that um, my partner, Jeff, got to observe in the field and trying to document it as best he could from far away with a, with a zoom lens. So as, as the babies do, as they get closer to shedding, they, that skin is like itchy. And so they do a lot of like rubbing their face on themselves and on sticks. And so House starts to get kind of restless here and he's kind of moving around, rubbing his face on stuff. And it, at some point his rubbing and restlessness takes him like around the back and then eventually turning around and he starts heading out from under the rock. Um, and he starts heading towards where he's gonna be in full sunlight um, and also in view of this potential predator, my partner, Jeff, right? Cause he's sitting not very far away. Um, and Priscilla reacted to this in what's a very strange way for someone who observes snakes a lot. She, she threw her neck out in this right angle. Let's see, yeah, but another nice little arrow there. So her neck is almost completely straight and her head is like crooked back at this, this 90 degree angle facing right toward where House was coming out. This is not a posture you see in snakes very often, but it very much looked like she was kind of making a wall out of herself. I'm, I'm sure you've seen parents, human parents do this kind of stuff with their kids too. And kind of like in the first story with Cat Mama, you know, the best judge of what they're trying to communicate and if they're successful is in what the, the other animal they're talking to does. And House like turned right around and crawled back in the back and then eventually went up to settle on top of Priscilla. <laughs> I kind of like, I used to describe it, him sitting in the back as sort of like the little kid in the dunce cap in the corner <laughs> on timeout. Um, so the message was, was through to him. So it was really interesting to see someone who was not the mother, you know, it's possible that she's a, a relative, like an aunt or a cousin um, or half sister um, to house, but, but definitely not his mom out there you know, taking care of him, making sure, you know, whether she was trying to protect him from going out into that intense sun and overheating because the babies are much more susceptible to that than adults, or if she was just trying to keep him away from Jeff, um, not sure, but was trying. And that's just another picture of Priscilla and House. Those two, for whatever reason, were really tight. They were together um, pretty much every day, right until House shed a skin and that family and Priscilla had her own kids and that family unit started to, to split up for the summer. And just in general, like as we've watched these nest sites, um, which are used by some, you know, different, different females every year at this site, there's um, several nests that are close enough. We can kind of walk between them and we've gotten to know some of these females and they'll use the same site over and over again, but they, um, they only give birth every two to three years, not every year. Um, so we've gotten to know some of their behavior and this picture is sort of, this is kind of the normal scene at the site once the mothers start having babies. You know, it's not, it's not one mom and one litter of baby and it's often not even, you know, one mom and one still pregnant snake. You'll have um, a snake that's just given birth. In this picture, there's um, a large snake that looks like it could be um, a large male, but it is, just because I know the snake, is actually a female. 
Um, there's a juvenile, an older juvenile snake in the back. On the left, there's a still pregnant snake. You can kind of see her bulging baby belly um, in the front, just to the left of the baby's tail. Um, so just, just a mixed group. It becomes sort of, it seems like a social site for some of the other snakes who may be stopping by to visit the moms and the new babies for whatever reason. Some of the snakes will show up and that's where they'll shed their skin over the summer and hang out for a while. But you see these real mixed groups of snakes, um, some of which may be helping to care for the kids, even if it's in sort of a passive way. Um, so this is this is an adult male snake here on the left with, um, there's two little babies, one at the bottom of the screen and then one that's sitting right next to him. This guy's name is Roger. And this was a male who, I'm not sure what he was doing at the nest. He wasn't shedding. He was just kind of came to hang out right after the babies were born. And the babies, this particular litter of babies just latched onto him and would hang out with him. And the male rattlesnakes are generally bigger than females if they're the same age. And so they're much more for, um, formidable. And, you know, thinking back to the squirrel, Sigma was an easy target for her because that Sigma is very small. Um, this snake, Roger, he could have eaten that squirrel. And while we have seen squirrels come up and sort of do their tail wagging behavior at adult male rattlesnakes in the spring when the snakes are still kind of sluggish and not eating, um, you know, it's possible that the presence of an adult male with these babies protects them from a squirrel and, and some other animals that it's gonna be less likely to attack an adult male than, than the babies, even if he's not really doing anything else, but just, you know, sitting there chilling. And this is more GoPro footage of um, that same nest site that I showed a couple pictures back, just to just to sort of get an idea of kind of the, the busybody activity of everybody. You know, again, we've got a pregnant female here. I can see a very enlarged body full of babies. Um, there's probably a mom in the mix there somewhere, an adult male and a bunch of little babies just coming and going at the, the opening. So it's it's just a it's a really interesting mixed situation that was just not at all what we kind of expected, it, you know, especially when you've you've learned in biology the trope of, you know, snakes just kind of drop their their eggs or babies and then are just done with them. Like they're ready to go, totally ready to take care of themselves as soon as they hatch or born. And that is not the case at all, at least not in rattlesnakes. And I'm and not in African rock pythons where parental care has also been documented recently in the last few years. And I'm guessing as we continue looking and now that we have tools like remote photography and videography will probably discover stuff like this in, in more species. Some other kind of interesting dynamics around these nests. Um, I'd sort of mentioned that the females will use these places through time, which is something we've seen. So this cute little baby um, is Zona. So this is when Zona was about seven or eight months old. This was actually taken the spring after she was born and she was hunting on a log near one of these nest sites. So we assume she was probably born at one of the nests nearby. Um, there's, a, there's a communal den there as well where she probably spent the winter, you know, and then was, you know, out for her first meal the following spring. Now that was cool. We identified her, we um, mark these guys, uh, or sorry, we identify these guys by their natural markings and aberrancies and the shape of the blotches on their back for the most part. And then if we catch them for DNA samples, we'll also paint their rattles so we have a backup method. And Zona was our superstar of how that identification method worked because we continued seeing her every six to 12 months for years. So this first picture that was in 2010 and this was 2011. So about a year later, same snake, which we identified by the patterns and then also with painted rattles, she's hanging around in basically the same area. And then Zona, when she would have been six years old, we found her looking like one of those deflated balloon snakes that has recently given birth with a couple little babies. And again, at this at the same area where she's been spending the winter and where we assume she was born, 
and she also returned to have her babies for the first time. Um, and then a couple years later, she was back. She's still pregnant in this picture. So she's actually the very large black snake, which um, I think a lot of people who are familiar with this species would identify her as a male because she looks very much like a, a big black male Arizona black rattlesnake. But we know by the, well, the fact that it's pregnant, so not a male, um, <laughs> by her blotches and a tiny bit of purple paint and that rattle that is in the very front of the slide. That is the purple paint that we gave that snake when she was six months old or six, seven months old. Um, so Zona kept using that site, returning to have her babies, which is pretty cool. And we've seen that with, with several of the snakes now, ones that we've actually, um, you know, were there when they were born. So we know who their mother is. I've seen them, um, I want to say come back to the nest where they were born, but actually in these cases, um, their mother switched nest sites, moved to a site a few meters away from that site, and they found the new nest site where their mom was at so they could have their babies along with their mom at the same place. And, and probably because they were younger, got stuck taking care of their siblings or half siblings <laughs> when they were born. Um, but yeah, it's been really neat to see that um, those, those relationships and transitions through time. So this is TWA. This is another snake that we've known a long time. We first met her in the spring of 2011 when she was looking like she would probably give birth that year, and she did. And we have seen TWA at that nest site every other year, so 13, 15, we didn't get up there in 17, so we didn't see her that year. And then last summer, 2019, we saw her again. And this picture and this, uh, this observation of her was really special um, because from the very beginning, when we first met her in 2011, she was very large, a very old looking female, judging by her size and the shape of her rattle. And she only had a couple of babies that, that first year in 2011. And so I, I remember thinking, wondering if that meant that, you know, you know, she's obviously old, maybe this is the end of her life or at least the end of her reproductive life, um, you know, but instead she's kept going another eight years. Um, and every year that she has had babies, she's always shared a nest with other females. And I have never seen her with a baby before last summer. And then finally, and initially when we saw her last summer, her babies were up with the, the nearby female who was still pregnant and younger, um, but actually managed, we actually managed to get a photo of one of her babies with her. <laughs> so finally, we got to see TWA actually uh, mothering her own kids for a change. And she looks pretty unhappy about that situation, probably hoping that they will crawl back up to the babysitter. Um, yeah, it's been really neat. I mean, if we, if we had to, to guess, TWA is probably pushing 20 years old at this point. She's a, a very old snake and could even be older than that. It's, you know, if you haven't been following them since they were babies, it's impossible to say for sure how old they are. I wish we could just count rattle segments, but that doesn't work. Um, and yeah, it, you can kind of see, you know, I talked about the deflated balloon and being able to see who's given birth and who hasn't. Um, and her part of her body that's on sort of the lower right part of the screen, you can kind of see a wrinkly bit of skin. And there is no wrinkly folded skin on pregnant snakes. So that was one of the reasons we knew that TWA had already given birth. So this video is just kind of like, a, at least when we put it together, a greatest hits, just a conglomeration of some cool stuff we've taken at Nest and Den Sites. Um, this is a lot of what my organization does, Advocates for Snake Preservation. And so this is just to give you guys a little teaser. Um, you know, I can't advertise any more in-person presentations at the moment, but we have lots of cool snake videos and stories on our website and you know, share them on Facebook and other social media whenever we can. Um, yeah, just to sort of give people another side of, of snakes. I think a lot of us have gotten into our heads from the stories we've been told since we were kids that snakes are sort of these 
mindless, cold-blooded, I mean, they are cold-blooded, um, but these mindless predators that, you know, just eat and reproduce and, you know, don't have these relationships and these whole stories that they do, but they do, and they do all kinds of cool stuff. And we love to film that and photograph that and tell people all about it. So yeah, that's what some of this is. And that is where you can find us or here on Facebook. If you're watching this on Facebook, you already know how to find us. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's it. Um, so I think we can do questions now. If there are any in Zoom and I've got Jeff watching Facebook to see if there's any questions that have come in over there. Well, Melissa, I have a question just to start out. Sure. Um, I think it's fascinating um, and probably extraordinarily confusing for you guys to track each individual snake when they're all coiled up in family groups and, and the young of, of one female is with different females. I mean, how are you guys sitting there all day trying to see an exposed tail to look for that, that marker if there is one? How does that, what are the challenges? Yeah. That is a very good question. So, um, so a couple of different things. So the, the remote cameras and ha or having any kind of video cameras help. We've just got that rolling all the time, having the, um, the footage of the snakes that we can refer back, back to. The, the first year when we were just sitting there watching, it was a lot of trying to figure it out with binoculars on the spot, who was who. Um, and I think, I still have an old slide in here that's of Zona that actually, yeah. So this shows how we do the identification. Um, and it's it's much easier when you're working from a photograph from a live snake. So the photo on the left from the spring of 2010, that was when we first found and, and captured Zona, one of the snakes I mentioned towards the end of the presentation. And so I've circled, I've circled on her in Photoshop, like each one of her odd shaped blotches that we use to identify her. Um, so we count starting at the neck and then we have like a, a data sheet for each snake that says, you know, Zona number eight has a Florida. So that's the one in the red circle. And, and I'm just making up numbers here because I don't remember exactly. Number 20 is a half and on the left and that's the one in the green circle. And, you know, we do that. We always try to get at least three markings. We've never found, I mean, we've certainly found snakes that have two of the same markings, but, um, or have one marking the same. I don't know that we've ever found one that has two the same in the same place, but three is definitely not. Um, so yeah, it's great if you can see the rattle, but if not, um, we try to do these and we always um, are noting the blotches as soon as we, we see a snake. Now just kind of everywhere all the time. So mm -hmm. the photo in the middle is from that fall. So she's a lot bigger. She'd actually doubled in size by this point. Um, and I used the same colored circle to note the, the same the same blotches and the same relative shape there. And then the following spring. And then I haven't, I put this together a long time ago, so I haven't done it as she's gotten older. But even now that she's a really dark snake, you can still pick out some of those blotches, especially that first one with the the, the tail, the thing that we call has a Florida <laughs> is very obvious. <laughs> and that's not another question I had was, do they all progressively get darker as they age or is that just specific to some? Um, so that is a trait with most Arizona black rattlesnakes. Hmm. It appears that in some populations, um, they, they don't ever get black. They, they just turn into these sort of like, like there are some Arizona black rattlesnakes that live in extreme western New Mexico. Um, and I haven't seen any pictures of black ones from New Mexico. It seems like most of them are, I mean, just to be honest, like they're not, they're not as pretty. Um, they're just like dark, dark brown, kind of reddish brown. Um, but yeah, that this snake, um, which was one of the first reasons we started working with them was just the, the wildly different color patterns and also the individuals have the ability to change color and trying to figure out why, because that's, that is not something 
common in snakes at all. Um, uh, so yeah, so this that is seems to be a trait with this species that as they get older, not just bigger. So one of the ways we could tell the difference between adult males and females is that um, if it's a, not a very big snake, but it's very dark black, that usually means it's a female because the males are relatively bigger. And so they'll get big while they're still fairly young and still kind of look like um, a ju juvenile color pattern. But that's, yeah, that's just for Arizona black rattlesnakes. Um, some of them, like the, the two species of rattlesnakes that we have around Silver City, rock rattlesnakes and black-tailed rattlesnakes, the babies and the adults are pretty much the same color. So there's, you unfortunately can't use that to age them. And if anybody wants to type questions in the chat box on Zoom, that's good. There's one from Devin. Um, he they, have you seen any dynamic or dominant family changes over time? Dominant family changes over time. Oh, hi, Devin. That's an interesting question. Um, you know, I think that, you know, thinking about the, the dominance thing with, you know, who's, who's the female that gets to hang out under the rock and who's the one that has to remain out in the open seeing her babies. I, you know, I think it, it feels like we've been watching these nest sites for a long time because in terms of how the attention span that scientists often have for places, it is kind of a, a long time. But for animals that, you know, may be living and reproducing for 20 or 30 years, we we haven't been. Um, so yeah, man, that'll be an interesting thing to keep an eye out for if some of the, you know, like Priscilla at this point, I imagine, um, if we see her again sharing a nest with other females, which we haven't in a while, she probably is getting old enough. Well, some of her babies should be there now to to help take care of babies and she might get to take that time off, but I can't think of any examples of that. Ah, so um, there is a, a question from Facebook and Beckett wants to know what the gestation period is that is an excellent question and, you know, kind of a, a confusing one for rattlesnakes. So in the rattlesnakes where this has been studied, um, some of them, so um, for most of the snakes in the Southwest or most of the rattlesnakes in the Southwest, they court and mate, do all their breeding stuff in the monsoon season. So July, August, September, but then they don't give birth until a full year later. That doesn't mean the gestation period is a year because technically you're not, they're not gestating until after they've ovulated. And for some of those snakes, they will store the sperm that they've gotten. They'll often mate with multiple males and then use perhaps only male from one sperm, maybe several, maybe just the first, maybe the last, maybe one in the middle. Um, often you'll have a litter with a lot of dads, I think six is the most that's been documented in a litter of Western diamondback rattlesnakes. Um, but often they'll just hold that sperm and they won't ovulate and fertilize their ova until the following spring. But it depends on the species. Some of them will do that in the fall and some of them will do that in the spring or uh, yeah, in the following spring. So it can be up to a year. And I guess the shortest is maybe four or five months, I'd have to check. I think Western Diamondbacks can have a pretty short one because they also have a, a breeding period in the, in the spring as they're coming out from their dens um, where they'll, there'll be some more mating going on. And so they might have, you know, some, the eventual litter that they have that summer might have some sperm from males that they bred with the, the summer before and then also from the spring before. So that is a, a good, 
maybe a probably more complicated answer than you thought. It's not like humans are just like nine months. <laughs> um, okay, so another question from Alex. Hi, Alex on Facebook. Why aren't more people studying the family aspect of snakes? Yeah, well, so I, I alluded to this earlier at, in a couple different ways. Um, I think more people are now studying the family aspect of snakes, which is really cool. And um, I mentioned real briefly that we now know that rock pythons um, who lay eggs and so they, and we've known for a while that like they'll, they'll sit with their eggs and incubate them. Um, they also take care of those babies after they hatch. They actually stay with the babies for a while and do this really neat thing where the mother who's much larger, this is one of those giant species like deer size, deer eating size snakes. Um, they'll come out on the surface to bask, they get really hot and then they go back in the nest burrow and share that heat with their babies. So instead of like feeding them, they're giving them heat, which is really cool. And the guy who documented that actually saw um, a presentation that we gave in 2012 when we had just started using these cameras to look at social behavior and he thought that was really interesting and so he started setting up cameras on his rock pythons and then discovered this you know that they were taking care of their babies so i i think it's a couple reasons that we're we're just now starting to see more people studying this and it's been rare before um, one is technology now we have ways of watching them without disturbing them, or at least with disturbing them less. And, and people are open to it. Whereas 20 years ago, even though it was published, the idea that it was anything more complicated than the mom just kind of sitting there um, was just not to be discussed. People just wouldn't give snakes that kind of credit. Um, I was gonna say even snake scientists, but honestly, especially snake scientists, we're often like the worst for just, you know, it's like, oh, they're just little little robots or whatever. So it's certainly getting better, but I think it's a combination of not having the tools at which we have now and, and not having an open mind, which thankfully people are coming around to. And the other question is also from Alex. Do females tend to stay tied to the same dens more than males? Ooh, boy, oh boy. I, we unfortunately don't have enough data to say that for sure. Um, that's a very good question. Um, we, we had wondered if the, you know, you would, you would expect to prevent inbreeding, you know, what usually happens with babies is when they're old enough to be independent, they disperse and they go to far places so they can find mates that aren't related to them. You would not expect to see them, everyone coming back to the same den and the same nest. And we don't know if they are picking mates from their den um, so it could be that they're just doing their travels during the summer and that males are doing that. Um, or it could be that there's a difference in the babies that are born at these nests with the males leaving and going and finding other dens so that they can meet unrelated snakes and maybe the females are staying. That was something that, you know, early on we wondered about and we were hoping to get some information, but we can't um, tell the difference between male and female babies without handling them um, in, a, in a fairly invasive way. And because we were, you know, most concerned with wanting to observe behavior, um, we really minimize handling this, you know, as I have this picture on the screen of a snake that we obviously handled and, and painted the rattle of. We did that because we found her a little ways away from one of the nest or den sites where we don't catch snakes. Um, when we were lucky enough to find one away, we would go ahead and and paint them and get DNA samples, hoping to someday look at relatedness. Um, so most of the babies, we don't know if they're males or females. And it just happens that, you know, maybe it just happens and maybe it's because there is that difference that a lot of the babies that we've seen as adults are females. I don't know that we have ever seen a baby as an adult at the nest or at the den that's a male. I think we've only ever seen females. 
that we first saw it as a baby. So it could be that the females stick more. I mean, certainly they're gonna be the ones most likely to come back to those nest sites since they're also nesting. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Something to keep an eye on. Well, you, you answered Denise Smith's um, question. She wondered if you ever handled the snakes. So it sounds like you pretty minimal, but also Dennis Lane asked at what point does a snake take its first meal? Ah, good question. So what we've seen is that pretty much so, you know, most of this is based off our studies of this one species, Arizona black rattlesnakes. It seems like a lot of the rattlesnakes are similar, but I imagine there are some differences. So I should, you know, put that out there that I keep saying rattlesnakes, but it's mostly this one that we know of. Um, so with Arizona black rattlesnakes, um, the babies would shed between 10 and 14 days old and soon after the last baby of the litter shed the family would start kind of splitting up the babies for the most part didn't appear to go very far at least after they started dispersing from right at that nest site um, for the next week or two we could kind of walk around nearby and see little tiny babies coiled up all over the place hunting um, and there, there were definitely some that we observed that had already gotten a lizard. Um, and because that's kind of the, the only thing small enough for them to eat at that point. They will eat mammals when they're older, but that's just, you know, there's not really like nesting mammals, I think, going on where they are in September. And, and they're not really like baby rattlesnakes don't go around raiding nests that we know of. Um, and, you know, it's kind of interesting at this site, um, there were three species of lizards that were real common there. And all three of those would have new, new hatchlings or newborns a week or two before the rattlesnakes started being born. It was very convenient timing for everyone. And the, the lizards apparently nested like right there because I mean, you, clockwork, if you got up there and you saw baby lizards, as soon as the lizards started popping out, you knew that the snakes would start coming in another week or two. So. The moms, I guess, have chosen a place where there are a lot of potential food items for the babies. And so although the babies can survive the winter without eating before they go in, um, because this timing, this is like the first couple weeks of September and there, you know, there's going to be snow on the ground potentially there like first of October, mid-October. So they don't have a lot of time. So they would like to get a meal as soon as possible, but they don't have to. They can survive until the next spring, but they're going to they're going to be really desperate for food at that point. So that kind of ties into Karen's question about what young snakes eat. But so does the mother ever provide food for them or she, like you said, they may just choose an area that has a lot of food for them to hunt. Yeah, which is kind of a way of providing, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So, um. For the most part, there's some very rare exceptions to this, but for the most part, snakes swallow their food whole. They don't, you know, have appendages to tear things up, although there is a snake that somehow manages to tear the legs off of a crab. And I, I've seen a video of it on one of those awesome BBC shows. I don't remember the name of the snake, but um, it was kind of fantastic. But for the most part, they swallow their food whole. So that would make feeding a litter of babies really difficult. <laughs> um, I, sh I haven't mentioned, but I should have that um, for the most part, during their entire gestation period, the mothers aren't eating. So I think it would be really difficult for them to, you know, after perhaps a year of not feeding or up to a year of not feeding, um, to go out and find, you know, eight tiny little food items for their eight babies. Um, and it varies. Sometimes they only just have, you know, one or two babies, but they, they depending on the species and their size and health, you know, they could have a couple dozen. Um, that would be a lot to be bringing back all those, that whole food item. So it may be something that someone sees eventually, but to my knowledge that has not been observed yet. Um, so there was another question on Facebook. Um, so one thing I have never read about snakes is do they recognize or acknowledge deceased snakes? Just curious if you have ever observed their reaction to encountering one of their own that's dead. So thank you, Heather, and hi, Heather, for that question. Um, 
Yeah, that's interesting. So I have not observed a snake interacting with a dead individual, but I have read and heard of anecdotes from other people um, that range from a, a male snake encountering a female snake that has recently been hit by a car and exhibiting what the person who saw it interpreted to be um, courting, like courting the dead body, either didn't realize they were dead or just they still, I mean, honestly, probably because they had been run over, smelled even more like a receptive female, um, just because the scent was so strong. Um, there was also a story, oh man, I'm, I'm, I'm so bummed. There is this beautiful poem and we have a like a meme of it on our Facebook page from the former poet laureate of Silver City, whose name I cannot remember. Um, yeah, what a bummer. It's beautiful, but um, her and her partner were driving on a road near here and they came across um, a snake that had recently been hit. And the poem was about that was, there was another snake that appeared to be kept trying to like come back on the road to get at that other snake. And she had wondered if, you know, if they knew each other, you know, maybe it was the case of like that other observation where it was a male and, and that one was a female. I don't think that they, you know, tried to, to determine the sex of the two snakes, but um, ended up, I think, moving the dead body off the road so that they didn't, um, you know, the other one didn't get hit. Seeger daughter, that's her name. That's her last name, Bet. But it's really beautiful. I will, I will share that graphic again on our Facebook page because it, it's really it's really cool and it's a neat story and you know it's real easy and a lot of people did poke holes in it you know I you know they saw that couple saw a really beautiful thing when they made that observation um, and it's really easy to write it off as a lot of things and it could be nothing it could be everything and there's a lot of it that we just don't know because it's hard it's really hard to interpret snakes behavior sometimes because they're just in a lot of ways, so different than us, especially in how they communicate. Um, but in a lot of ways, it actually turns out they're they're real similar once we know how to, to look at them. Um, Alex asks if our group is different for being so hands off. Oh, um, so there was another Facebook question. Um, Alex wanted to know if our group was different and our approach to being hands off with snakes. Um, so certainly in respect to trying to find ways to, to do science and make meaningful observations, um, it's a lot harder um, to, to do some things, um, you know, like we would have an idea of the, the sex of all these babies and, and counts and who it was related to, <clears throat> excuse me, if we had captured every animal as soon as we had seen them, that would be a lot easier. Um, on the other hand, the only reason that we got the footage of the behavior that you saw here and, and a lot of the other stuff we've gotten is because we have left the snakes alone. Um, they tend to behave differently, especially at a certain place if people are always messing with them. Um, that's what a lot of other scientists who work at some of these sites have observed. Um, so I, I think in some places people are again starting to to come around to that because they see um, and, and we're not the only ones who, who do this. Um, we learned the method of identifying snakes by their pattern um, from from a guy who most people would call an amateur herpetologist but knows more about snake behavior and reproduction than most of us and and he's been identifying snakes this way for like 30 something years. Um, so there are some other scientists and groups out there like that. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it, it, is, it is a little different from how science is usually done. You know, we're also lucky that um, the site where most of this footage was taken or yeah, most of this footage was taken, the snakes have been very tolerant. Um, it also has a nice mix of, of being in a, the forest where the snakes aren't so hot. They're just hiding under rocks all day like they are in the desert. <laughs> like you don't get to see western diamondback rattlesnakes doing a lot of parental care because they are hiding. I mean they're in they're in the shade and burrows and under rocks and stuff during the day so you just don't get to see it. Um, 
But we think that one of the reasons the snakes have been so tolerant here is that for the most part, the people who know about this place have not captured the snakes at these sites. And so we get to enjoy seeing this interesting stuff that we can share with other people.